I read a lot as a kid, uh, a lot of science fiction. Uh, I had a, a wonderful professor as an undergraduate, a guy named Jack Goins, who was the first anthropologist at UCR. Uh, he spent endless hours, hundreds of hours, kind of validating curiosity and helping me work through an argument. And uh, I went to Berkeley as a graduate student and ended up taking a seminar from John Rowe, uh, who said, okay, this is the project that you're going to do, and took us into the, the basement of the, the Phoebe Hearst Museum and said, you'll work on this collection. Uh, about two weeks later, he came down and said, I thought I told you to get the damn pots out, and, uh, which I promptly did. It was, in that, it was in that tone. It was very intimidating. Uh, fortunately, I had the, the assistant director of the museum and two of the curators or preparators were archaeologists who had worked in Peru, all three of them, in fact. And they were incredibly helpful. And so I, I learned a, a very fundamental lesson at that point, which is the importance of collaboration. Uh, I, another point of the collaboration was I had to take a core theory class, uh, which was uh, politely miserable. And uh, uh, one of my classmates was a, a cultural anthropologist named Richard Lee who, uh, and there were, there were no photocopying machines in those days. Uh, so we had to, we had to go to the library to read them, it's, which is a strange place for some students. Uh, but we had about 300 pages a week to read, which was beyond any mortal's capacity to do so. Uh, so we said, well, you know, why don't we cooperate on this thing and you take notes on these three and type them on, on carbon paper. Uh, so you get these ratty copies of, of all of the notes on all of the articles. Uh, by the time you had the sixth or seventh carbon copy, it was very hard to read, uh, but it was, it was a, a second lesson. Uh, as, as Wendy said, I, I went to Peru the first time in 1961 and I'd taken two courses on Andean culture, history, and, and peoples of the Andes. When I got there, I, it took about 30 minutes to figure out this was, I had, did not expect this. I was stunned. And uh, uh, it didn't fit any of the perceptions, that things that I'd been told in class, or <coughs> in those two classes. and. Uh, uh, that imprint is still there. What I found in that period was that the, the, what made sense of my perceptions was some of the left-wing newspapers. Uh, it was a time of a civil war. There was violence in the city. They had spit on Richard Nixon when he came through. And uh, so it was, uh, the, the anti-American sentiments were very high. Uh, I, I did my field work there uh, after a couple of years in graduate school. I, got, I was fortunate enough to get a Fulbright, which Yolanda just got one also. And uh, so that's cool. Uh, not to Peru. Uh, uh, I was offered a job at UCR while I was writing my dissertation, at UC Berkeley while I was writing my dissertation. And I taught four classes I'd never taken. And, <laughs> Uh, so I was literally one day ahead of the students in the four classes, and I was continually worried that they'd find out I was a fraud. Uh, so I, I, uh, I decided I'd look very professorial, since I was only a couple of years older than many of the students. Uh, so I got, I got the tweed jacket and the narrow tie, and I decided, the elbow patches, and I decided I, I would smoke a pipe. Now, <laughs> I, I chain smoked when I was in graduate school, uh, but I never smoked a pipe, so I you know, carefully lit this thing and uh, flames billowed six inches high out of it, uh, which kind of blew the, the, the image. Uh, 
that I was trying to create. Uh, I had, fortunately in that class, I had three uh, really terrific students. And I've, I've long put together, you know, who are the students I really remember from, from where I've taught. And uh, these were uh, uh, Sylvia Foreman. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Karen Bruins and uh, Alice Francisco. <laughs> I learned more from them than I taught them. So I, one of the questions that I think it was Sylvia asked me one day, I'd, I was teaching a course on South American ethnology, which I <coughs> kind of knew not very much about. And I showed a map of South America and she's looked at me and said, why are the glaciers where they're glaciers and uh, weren't there glaciers there? So I said, great question, I'll get back to you. It took a year <laughs> and um, I get back to her. Uh, and it was uh, uh, Ed Lanning and I published a piece on the question uh, that we'd worked on and then with a uh, climatologist at at MIT, uh, where I was living at that point. Uh, uh, Richard Lee and I were, were hired at Harvard at the same time, and uh, it was acutely uncomfortable if you were a working class kid. Uh, uh, Richard describes it as our faux Brook Brothers suits days. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, So uh, the thing I learned from that early classes that I taught was the, 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 when students ask questions, I would say, well, this is an interesting question. I'll get back to you. Uh, you guys still ask interesting questions, and um, we'll get back to you. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, the Harvard was not a particularly friendly place for uh, junior faculty or for working class backgrounds. Uh, so every Friday I would get together with students, graduate students, and with George Cogill who taught at Brandeis, so it wasn't threatening. Richard Lee would come along frequently, and we'd go to a pizza joint and drink beer and talk about, you know, what the hell was going on. And uh, so after about, about five, three years there, and I resigned because it was, uh, I, I got tired of dealing with the brain, dam brain damaged offspring of the bourgeoisie. Uh, so I, I, I took a job where I thought things would be better, but I got fired from that one at Yale. Uh, but I, two, two really good things came out of, the, out of the New Haven experience. Again, there were some terrific, terrific students. The, the junior faculty weren't as competitive. Uh, I played football in an all-black city league, which was I, really a, eye-opening experience, uh, some of the scars of which I still have. And a comment by Mike Coe, who said, you know, if you really want to learn a subject, te teach a course in it. And uh, I went to Temple at that point. Uh, uh, and I was living in a collective in New York. Uh, this was the late, the late 19, early 1970s. And um, this is where I started having conversations with historians, with Karen Spaulding and with uh, other people in the, in the collective who were involved in anti-war and, you know, kind of anti-racism and the women's movement and the anti-nuclear movement. And uh, I also, was in, at that point was involved in, uh, participated in uh, uh, Marx reading groups. Uh, now, they mostly weren't academics. And the, the really in, for me, the really interesting things in the 70s were happening outside the university. Um, so I, I participated in a number of those. They, they kind, of, kind of merged into, uh, political activity of one sort or another. Uh, I, it was one I remember vividly. I was involved in the, uh, 
the formation of something called the Upper West Side Committee in solidarity with the people of Chile. Uh, and I, I met a number of colleagues from, from Chile, and uh, many of whom had been jailed, uh, some of whom had been killed with the, with the Allende, when Allende was ousted by Pinochet. Uh, one of the, the people in those groups was a, uh, an economist who had worked in the, in, the, um, in the Allende government. He'd also worked with Che Guevara in Cuba. And uh, so he was a very member, of, a very regular member of, the, the, uh, of these reading groups, at least the ones I was in. And he regularly referred to us as jerk academics or jerk professors. Uh, and he urged me always to, to think about, you know, uh, I, I can't do his Brooklyn accent any well, but it was uh, always look at the balance of power when you're answering something, analyzing something stupid. And that was really great advice. Uh, uh, Eddie and I became pretty good friends. Uh, but there, there was not a lot of deference there. Uh, I started going to anthropology meetings uh, around 1980, and this was partly because Richard Berger, an, an old student and friend, invited me to, to give a paper about, in Washington about some stuff I'd written, and they paid for the train ticket and the, and the hotel. Uh, so I went, so I gave the paper, and. Uh, uh, it was a, a, a paper that was explicitly grounded in Marx, and it was divided into two parts. So the part that got published was actually the data section, the part where I, the Marxist analysis, uh, it, it's, I think it exists in Xerox at this point. Uh, but uh, at the same time, another kind of an an what was called the Northeastern Anthropological and Ethnohistorical Conference started meeting. So I, I went to the, I, went to those for the first two years. One was in New York, about five blocks from where I lived, and the second one was in, I think, in Ithaca. No, the second one was in, in Amherst, actually. Uh, so I trundled up there and gave another paper, and, and uh, uh, one of the people in the audience was Bob Painter, and uh, uh, so that's, anyways, that's where, where Bob and I met, and uh, what he told me about was there's a group called there's a group that of archaeologists, historical archaeologists, mostly were interested in Marx, and uh, or at least would talk about him. So I said, "Gee, that sounds interesting." Those there there are not very many of them, and uh, so it met regularly at at either Amherst or at at Binghamton. Uh, so this got me into touch with with Bob, and Linda, and more. Um, with Randy McGuire and a number of other people who would show up at these things. And, and uh, occasionally Bruce Trigger would come down from Canada. Uh, at the same time, I, I also went to another conference in Puerto Rico where I met uh, many of the, the Marxist scholars, archeologists in Latin, in Latin America. And they had been meeting regularly since 1970 uh, from the International Congress of Americanists that was held in Lima, but they'd been meeting kind of annually, and that, that actually still goes on. Uh, and uh, Wendy and I went to it. My first one went uh, about five years ago, six years ago, and it was terrific. Uh, <coughs> at, at, at Temple, I had a, my colleague and, and, and compañero for many years was Judy Good, who was sitting, sitting over here. Uh, we always ended up on, mostly on the right side of things and lost. Uh, uh, at Temple, Temple was a very interesting place to work, much more so than Harvard or Berkeley. And uh, the students were much more interesting because it was a more diverse student body. But, uh, one of the th things going on there was uh, uh, the formation of a faculty union, and Judy was, was centrally involved in that, and 
uh, it, was, it was basically a, a lapdog union for the, for, the, for the administration. And around 19, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, uh, some of us thought this was not a great idea. And so we, we replaced the leadership and, and then pr uh, probably organized strikes. And I would do that, help to organize those for the next eight years. Uh, only two of which I think culminated in a strike, but you were involved, I think, in, in negotiations that ended at five in the morning or something like that. And we would have gone out a third time in 84. Uh, so you got to meet some very interesting people there. And Judy was certainly, certainly one. Uh, she was also my model as to what a good department chair would be. Uh, I generally have held until recently, I've generally held department chairs and deans in very low regard uh, uh, with, with terms that really I shouldn't repeat since you're recording this. Uh, uh, so at Temple, anyways, I, during the 80s, I, I regularly taught uh, courses on Marx with, uh, with colleagues like Peter Grant in history, Kathy Walker in history, and, and Peter Rigby. Um, in anthropology, uh, the 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 Marx group that read I should I should point out was uh, the the political this, there was a political twist in it in 1985 when uh, we formed American Archaeologists Against Apartheid, and uh, this was this was a, a turning moment I think for a number of us. Uh, we got about 400. Signature saying that you know that <clears throat> we should support this, and with much opposition in the American Anthropological Association, the Society for American Archaeology, and the National Science Foundation, who wouldn't provide travel grants. Uh, so I learned a, a really good lesson at that point: is that I had absolutely no idea how those associations worked, uh, and that. Uh, if we're going to continue to do things like this, then I, we all needed to get to know them better. Uh, and Wendy tells a story that, that uh, there was a, a council of Marxist anthrop anthropology that was slowly, slowly dwindling in numbers in the association. And, so I, we, the Bob and McGuire and Phil Cole and some other people were wondering how the hell could we could get something on the floor of the American Anthropological Association, which a, a few years earlier had made it impossible to make motions from the floor. And so I, uh, when Christine and I encountered Wendy in the hall, and who's, she was on the executive committee, and we said, we said, how did we get this something on the floor? And, uh, she says we we're intimidating. I thought we were just curious. Uh, 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 dirt. I didn't trust you at all. Yeah. Well, uh, in in. There also during the eighties, uh, one of the Marx groups actually read in the, met in the back of a cop bar in West Philadelphia. Uh, which I didn't know it was a cop bar when I first. Thing was going there, and it was, but it was frequented by members of the Labor or Red Squad, as it was frequently referred to. And during the strikes, I got to know a number of them very, very intimately, uh, as did Judy. Um, in the, uh, I had offended the sensibilities of my department chair, who wasn't Judy, uh, one of one of her miserable precursors. Uh, <laughs> And I, I was, uh, the, the, the neoliberalization of the university was taking place, so they, um, and so it meant you know, charging the students more money and giving them fewer courses, but one of the courses was required since they had surplus faculty at that point. Uh, it was a course called Western Intellectual Heritage, and uh, the, the chair volunteered me to teach this, which I'm not particularly happy about it, since it was a required course in the students hated it, and uh, I got some of the worst teaching evaluations I ever got for, for in the first time I taught it. Uh, over the years, I, I worked out a, a program uh, that, it, that 
with other people, Peter Grand most notably, that we called anti-Western anti intellectual heritage. Uh, and uh, so that's the, that's the origin of the Inventing Western Civilization book. And uh, there was a, 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 about 10 years, I was doing this for about 10 years, I was teaching at least twice a year. And the, uh, the director who had been an XCP member whose sensibilities I had offended during some strike, uh, he had, had moved consider considerably to the right and was in the national, one of the founding members of the National Scholars Association. Uh, so he, he was the director of the thing. He figured out what we were doing, so we, we were kind of dismissed from, from teaching it. And we, which is, you know, I kind of liked the course at the end. I, I mean, I learned a hell of a lot from, from reading and doing, talking with the students and trying to figure out what it was that, that should be sabotaged. And, uh, so I guess, I guess the, the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that uh, in, the, in the late 1980s, Wendy talked about it briefly, his two Venezuelan colleagues asked me if I'd write this book on, on Mesoamerican archaeology. And uh, the, the, the subject was broached actually in a, in a conference that Bob organized for the Wintergren Foundation that met in Cascais. And, uh, uh, which brought together people from kind of around Europe and, and North America and Latin America. And it's it a very interesting conference because the, the, uh, I remember the opening meeting as you had somebody f from the Chilean Communist Party and somebody from the Italian Communist Party were duking it out as to who was more Marxist than the other one. And uh, uh, they're both good friends, so I, I've, I've omitted their names. Uh, all, the, 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 it was very, it was interesting because the, the, there were a number of women at the, at the conference. And this is before gendering archaeology or anything like that. There were five women there, and they got, they got annoyed at something, so they, they stomped out of the meeting one day and kind of looked at me and said, you can come with us. <laughs> and we sat out on the, on the beach at Cascais, which is the westernmost point in Europe, and it has 60 or 70 mile an hour winds. That's, those are the gentle gusts. So I came back in, and my, my glasses were sandblasted. And, uh, so the, the Venezuela, I, that's where you write of Argus asked me to write this book, and um, that's, that's when I approached Wendy. After, it took about two years before it agreed to do it, and, and that's when I, I asked her for the pictures. Huh? the people Yeah, one was, one was in jail and the other was dead. And, uh, uh, so this, this, didn't, this didn't bode well, you know, there was something, something wrong with this. Uh, so, anyways, I asked Wendy for the uh, for the pictures, and uh, she said yes. And I asked her out for lunch and took her to this place that was wasn't open. So I, I said, well, we went to another place, and I said, well, let, let's try it for dinner sometime. And she said, yeah, I'll give you a call. And I was about six weeks later, she got back to me. <laughs> uh, uh, Truthiness, <laughs> details. Uh, so, uh, I have a lot of people to thank, and I've, I've mentioned some of them. I want to thank Saga, and I want to thank all of the students that I've had over over the years. Uh, I've learned much from you, more than I've taught or conveyed. You've asked thought-provoking questions. You've forced collaboration, and You've, you've stoked my curiosity and you've taken me to places that I never thought I would go. Uh, so, and I certainly never imagined. I also have to thank, uh, when I got here as the chair, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to be a chair. Judy was my model, uh, but it was, the situation was very different. So, uh, we had a, a the, the departmental assistant, the kind of Lilia Lederbox, Vega's predecessor was was there was she was there for about my first five years here and uh, she was very protective of the department she'd been here 35 years and had seen faculty come and go and, and uh, 
uh, she was very protective, and it was very hard to get information out of her, so it took me several years to do this. In the, in the meantime, I, I, uh, I decided that I, there's a whole other layer of the university that I didn't understand. Uh, so I went down to the, to the MSO in Women's Studies and uh, said, what's going on here? I don't understand. And brought her chocolate. And so, so I, had, I had this regular network that I would, I would go for uh, many years. Uh, I, I, I saw Lily at that cheers me in these monthly awful cheers meetings. And she, she was incredibly bright, m much more so than most of the chairs in the room. And uh, uh, so given turmoil in the, in the economics department, she was kind of looking. So I said, hey, would you like to go out to lunch? <laughs> and uh, I, I, I woo her with chocolates today. So, uh, so the the woman in it went in 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 women's studies was was named Chris King and uh, she was an an amazing source of information. She told me more about my department that I was chairing than I actually knew about it. Uh, I also have a few faculty members here that I need to to acknowledge. Uh, there's a there's a, a coffee and sandwich place in Canyon Crest called Jam and Bread, and uh, uh, I had I met regularly f for five years, six days a week, with Steve Cullenberg, with Joe Childers, Linda Bell, and and Catherine Kinney. I, I learned about the university at that point, how the how the place actually worked. It was a, a five-year intensive seminar, and. Uh, uh, Another person I should acknowledge is, is, is Christine and Yolanda, and two other people are Christine and Yolanda. Uh, Christine and I, the, the book that, was, was, that she and I edited back in the 80s, uh, we had some difficulty getting published uh, with the American Anthropological Association, and they, somebody in the Library of Congress actually, the, the key words that they use are communism and anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 something you want to put on your resume in the. In the <laughs> so, uh, Yolanda, I'm not sure where I met Yolanda. I knew about her. I've known about her since the. Jesus, I don't know how, how long ago, 80s, 70s, 80s. Uh, I think where we might have met was either when you were at City College, could be, or when you were president of the American Anthropological Association and Louise Lamphere said, hey, would you, would you mind editing the book Culture and Diver Cultural Diversity in the United States, which had kind of foundered uh, at that point. Uh, so I said, yeah, you know, I'll do it, but I want Ida Susser to work with me on it. And uh, so I think you and I may have met then, but we may have met uh, in, in the early 90s when you were there. Uh, uh, June Nash said, hey, would you like to come up and give a talk and maybe talk about being chair at, at City College? And uh, I, I gave the talk and had a delightful dinner with June and uh, Saskia Sassen and uh, a number of other people and uh, decided it was not a, uh, a place where that I wanted to be put between a rock and a hard place. And uh, the, there was an African American studies program there, and uh, it was quite Afrocentric. And I, I knew some of the players involved in it from struggles at Temple, uh, where at one conference I'd actually served as a guest referee between the classical, somebody from Penn who did classical archaeology, and a number of Afrocentric scholars who. Uh, he had some problems, I, th I think, under, you know, kind of reading history. And, um, uh, and a guy named uh, Martin Bernal, who was a, a, a political theorist at, at Cornell, who wrote a, a book called Black Athena, which if you've, you've never read, you should read it. Uh, basically, he, he shreds the, prof the profession of classical archaeology and classics in the United States and points out uh, certain connections that classicists found 
disturbing. Uh, and so that, that's another set of relations that go, goes on. So there are a number of these groups that suddenly you, you start with one thing and they suddenly morph and you, it, some, something new emerges. Uh, so the, 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 the theory group that Bob and Randy McGuire and, were in, and Phil Cole were involved in uh, which was various call, it was called RATS, and you could translate that in various ways from the radical archaeology theory group to radical archaeologists talk shit, or right. two, <laughs> two common ones. Uh, that's, that morphed into a series of things that were going on in the, in the Midwest and called the Marxism and Science Congress, and that, that brought one into uh, connections with a whole series of other, other folks, and uh, like Al Zagarel and, and uh, uh, Antonio Gilman, whom I, whom I had known as a, when he was a graduate student. Uh, so anyways, let me, let me stop there and just again thank you so much for, uh, for all that you've taught me.